Yeah, I was near the front of the truck. It blew me to the back of the truck. And I just remember laying there, and then I kind of came to. It was really weird. And then all the noise started coming back. Yeah, I got up and got back in the fight. Started maneuvering my soldiers. We had nine wounded. And that's when it really started, you know, sinking in like, wow, we're in a huge fight. I'm Jonathan Silk, and I share hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. All right, well, today I've got a fellow on here that is is really quite accomplished, and I'm honestly very proud that we get to talk to him today. This is Major Jonathan Silk, and when you hear about this guy, you'll realize why I've made a mistake, probably, in interviewing John Silk rather than his wife, Stacy. You never know who has (laughs) shared more hope. In situations like this, Stacy and John live in West Point, New York with their kids. He's a triathlete, advocate for veterans and wounded warriors. John serves for Team Red, White, and Blue as the National Veterans Outreach Director. John started in the Army as an infantryman in 1987. He has a lot of accomplishments with the military, a lot of training there. He's served in Iraq, Korea, Afghanistan, and now proudly glad to have him back in the USA. He's received the General Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award for exhibiting exemplary leadership in the areas of duty, honor, and country. Look that up earlier, John. That's really amazing. Not many folks get that. Bronze Star with Distinguished V. The icon V stands for Valor. You should look that up as well. Anybody who doesn't know about that. Purple Heart. He has quite an education, several degrees, a master's in learning technologies, also another master's, University of Texas, and a business degree. He is currently an educator at the Center for the Advancement of Leadership Development and Organizational Learning at the United States Military Academy in West Point, teaching some of the nation's and world's greatest future leaders. Uh, If you know much about West Point, you'll you'll realize that the folks who go through there are not just our soldiers. There's a lot of uh, very special people from around the world who get to come and experience one of the best educations on the planet. So, John, Thanks for all you're doing. I know you have even more to tell us. John has a really interesting story of, uh, of some things from his days in the military. But, John, a little more about yourself, and then I'm going to get into the questions. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, you did a good job in the intro. Um, really, um, I uh, enjoy, uh, right now, I uh, enjoy um, endurance sports, enjoy uh, time with my family, um, and enjoy doing work uh, with veterans, especially veterans that are transitioning. A mm. uh, specific uh, thing I'm very passionate about is, is wounded veterans and helping them um, um, recover, mm-hmm. um, men- both mentally and physically, and um, yeah, you know, and then rebuilding their lives or continuing on in their lives and getting a part of the American dream they've uh, they're entitled to. That's a good point. I hear that's a really tough transition for a lot of folks getting back. Um, off the field and back into the real life. Yeah, I, it's just a different thing. Like coming back, um, like you know, in combat, especially if you're, in, you know, there's a lot of different jobs when you're deployed. Mm-hmm. Um, and no matter what you're doing, uh, you're part of a team. So a lot, a lot of soldiers, I think, uh, struggle. There's such a sense of purpose when you're overseas. Um, you know, and you're part of a team that's very has this laser beam focus, this purpose to mm-hmm. accomplish a mission. Once you get back to the states, you know a lot of a lot of soldiers, I think, don't don't see that, have, feel that same purpose. Um, mm-hmm. Then it's usually they come isolated to get out of the military, and then things can, uh, you know, sometimes spiral out of control from there. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I'm glad started. you're doing it. I really am. Thanks for the help. Well, you know how this works, John. We ask five questions about hope, and the first one is. A softball, so give it your best. <laughs> <laughs> How do you define hope, and and or what's your favorite hope quote if you have one out there? Um, my favorite hope quote is really uh, I think I want to say Desmond Tutu said this, but it's uh, being able to see that there's light despite all the darkness. Hmm. Um, and that's really what oh. what hope is to me: being able to see that light out there, hmm. and then knowing it's like at the end of the tunnel, even though the tunnel might seem all all, all dark. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Say it one more time for me. Um, hope is being able to see that there's light despite all the darkness. Wow, that is good. All right, question two. I think you might have to reference question one again here in a second. <laughs> but question two. In your life, who's given you the most hope? 
Um, that's it's that's a so I thought a lot about that that question. I, I derive hope from you know people around me, not just. It's hard to say one person. My wife Stacy definitely gave me a, a lot of hope. My kids, but those my, uh, other veterans and soldiers and friend, friends around me, mm -hmm. seeing uh, people, um, you know, dealing with adversity, and in every you know, not necessarily just soldiers, but people that are generally dealing with adversity. Um, they're overcoming adverse adversity, and they give me hope. So I just draw strength from watching other people, reading other people's stories, hearing other people's stories. Boy, that's the truth, isn't it? I do too, which is a lot of the reason why I'm doing this, is uh, <laughs> I need more. Okay, question number three, and, and tell us a story here. Take your time. Love to hear details. Set a good scene for us. When was hope all you had? How did you use hope to make it through a tough situation? What was going um, on? Well, um, is this appropriate time to share my you know, story? Abs being absolutely. Wounded? Yeah, anytime you want. Um. When I when I was deployed in Iraq, uh, at one point we were in a pretty big a uh, pretty big uh, fight um, in southern Iraq. It was actually mm -hmm. on April 9, two thousand four, and um, during the fight, uh, nine of my soldiers were wounded. Um, oh. But during the fight, I, uh, I I I was engaged in an enemy position, and uh, my truck we we got we got engaged with a rock propelled grenade. Um, Whoa! It um. Oh. It uh, hit, hit about 15 feet in front of my truck, did not detonate, um, then, then ricocheted up. I had my body armor on, and it hit me in the chest. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was a pretty were you in your, in your truck at this point, or are you standing no. outside? Yeah, we were dismounted. I could tell. Uh, we were, so my platoon, let me back up a little bit. I apologize for that. We were, uh, our, our mission was to seize a bridge um, in al Qut, Iraq. And... Mm -hmm. um, so we, we we attacked the bridge and, and we're supposed to seize the uh, far far side of the intersection on the eastern side, and um, our intelligence had told us that there would be no uh, enemy resistance. That once we're in position, though, we might make enemy contact later. Um, another platoon cleared the, the near side. We we're supposed to move through them. They got they got into a, a pretty big fight that lasted about thirty minutes. So at that point, we knew um, there was enemy in the area. Um, right before I crossed, we uh, we had an Apache gunship pass down to us. Um, yeah, so we, I pushed him over. He did a quick reconnaissance of the far side, in which there was a uh, he described there was a building uh, which was an Iraqi police station. But he, he said he told he came over the net. I still remember his day. They said negative enemy contact. So uh, we you know we we, we start our attack. Um, I pushed like two of my trucks. I had six trucks total. Two went out about 500 yards in front of me. Then, then I moved, and then I had in my rear section behind me by about you know 500 yards behind me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just remember coming over the bridge, um, and there's a little crest in the bridge coming over, looking at the far intersection. It was just this like wave of tracers. Um, it's it was pretty crazy. It's crisscrossing. Um, my mm -hmm. trucks. One of them was already uh, been engaged. With, uh, a couple RPGs was smoking. The other one was a dead stop, and it, it got engaged as well. Wow. Um, and then we came in the far, coming that intersection. My driver, you know, God bless him, swerved. We started taking uh, machine gun fires. We're coming to the intersection. I guess it's like a wave of steady tracers. I don't know how we didn't get hit. Um, hmm. and we we uh, impacted with the like the median, um, like on a sidewalk. It's about the Iraqi <laughs> sidewalks, like six feet in the air. <laughs> so we hit it and we crashed. We came to a sit. Um, we came to a complete stop. Um, we we're sit, sitting there. We started taking fire. When we we crashed, I got hurled into the dashboard. There was like a little metal mount where the uh, the global positioning system sits. So I kind of got hurled into that and took a, a hit to the chest. Wow. Recovered from that, I had to dismount to get in the fight. Um, my driver was okay. My gunner was a little shooken up. Um, as I dismounted to, to take a firing position up over the hood. Um, that's when we got engaged with a rock pug grenade, and I was kind of moving toward the hood to, to get in the firing position. Um, that's when it hit, did not detonate, or I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Ricocheted up, hit me in the chest, and uh, they still plowed me in the chest, and that up coming. I was near the front of the truck, it blew me to the back of the truck. I guess so. Wow. And uh, <laughs> um, I just remember laying there. Probably wasn't more than a, a minute, but you know, my it was my driver was over there by my side. 
And then uh, it kind of came to. It was really weird. And then all the noise started coming back. And I, I got I had to, I got up and got back in the fight. Um, really? It turned out, yeah. You were able I, to get up in the middle of all that? Yeah. I, it was, <laughs> I didn't have a choice. We were taking. Yeah, I guess so. Wow. I, I guess really, reflecting on it, I mean, I didn't have a. <laughs> I just we got back in the fight and uh, started maneuvering my soldiers. We had nine wounded. Um, secured them in an area where they could get uh, their wounds treated. Everything started coming back to me. Got 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 my senses back. When it, we were still taking a lot of fire, and mm. I was laying there, um, and I really had no choice but to get back in the fight. Um, I was a platoon leader, hmm. and so got back up, um, and then started maneuvering my platoon. I first went to check on my, uh, went to the other side of our perimeter, mm-hmm. right uh where my platoon sergeant was, my second in command, and just check with him. We found out um, they were dragging. They got our wounded back into that area where it was secured. It was a covered position behind um, this concrete wall. Mm-hmm. And that's when it really started, like, you know, sinking in, like, wow, we're in a huge fight. This was We hadn't been in a fight like this yet. Um, so I started uh, trying to make, get, get communications with my commander, tried to get a gunship in there. That, that didn't work right away. Mm-hmm. Um and then, so once I had my uh, wounded secured, I took the remaining of my soldiers and we started maneuvering, um, established the base of fire, and started maneuvering on some of the enemy positions and uh, just engaging, uh, engaging and destroying those uh, those positions, taking them out. Um, wow. Kept calling, trying to get a gunship in there, and never, never came in. And the Apache came back. He kept coming over the net saying he couldn't, you know, too dangerous for him. Mm-hmm. Um, so eventually... Uh, I couldn't maneuver. We were still taking fire from a, from a position I couldn't get to. I didn't have enough soldiers. So we ended up pulling, um, grabbing our wounded, pushing my wounded back across the bridge to the uh, to the other platoon where they were they had secured the area. And then we pushed back across the bridge and we brought in a AC-130 Spectre gunship. Wow. Um, <laughs> and that, that, that finished off the, uh, that, <laughs> the one enemy position we couldn't get to. Yeah. Um, so then we went back across the bridge. And then uh, cleared out the remaining houses. And anyway, uh, ended up, you know, we're successful in our mission. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next day, uh, fast forwarding a little bit, uh, we got relieved back um, back on our uh, this base. And just a quick lesson on this is uh, the coalition forces at that time in 2004 in southern Iraq it was the Ukrainians, the Georgians, some of our coalition partners. Yeah. Well, they had, they had deployed. They had been sent over there with different rules of engagement. Mm-hmm. So this, uh, we were, we were, the enemy at the time, the insurgent force we were engaging was a Shia militia, the Mahdi militia. Well, earlier that week, they had uh, pushed the Ukrainian force and the Georgians. I want to say there was a Georgian contingent too. They had pushed them back onto their base. So that that was okay. that's what we we're operating out of. Anyway, the next morning, uh, we were back on there, restock on an ammo and everything, getting ready to conduct operations. Took my vest off, um, and, I, and I had a big, I had a bruise on my chest. My plate was cracked. I didn't think wow. anything of it. I was like, oh, I'm good to go. <laughs> wow. Um, and I didn't even I didn't get checked <laughs> out. <laughs> so <laughs> um fast forward I actually had taken what I forgot to mention, I had taken another hit in the side during the fight, some more shrapnel. Mm-hmm. Um, it knocked me over but it wasn't as bad as the first one. Um uh, during the just, same fight? Yeah. In the middle of that fight. We it was pretty that, that fight lasted and I'm sorry if I'm jumping around. Yeah, that fight, the fight on the bridge lasted about three and a half hours for us. Wow. So it was a pretty... Uh, it was a pretty Any pretty injuries from the shrapnel from the uh, original hit? Or the the side hit? Uh, no. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what contributed to the injury I'm about to describe. Okay. I finished out the deployment. We continued conducting operations. Uh, from there, we went down to the Kufa Najaf area of Iraq. Um, saw a lot of more fighting, um, and I didn't take, I didn't take any more hits, but, uh, <laughs> um, once we deployed back home, um, and we're starting to, uh, so we went, got back home, went, went on leave, and then once we got back, we started getting back in our regular garrison routine, doing physical fitness every day. My level of fitness wasn't improving with everybody else. Hmm. Um, and I knew there was a problem. I was, I kept pushing myself. Um, you know, I was not running good. I was, I was always smoked. Um, and you know, I thought there was something wrong with me. I was like, you know, 
kept calling myself a wuss. You know, my inner voice was like, "What's oh. what's wrong with you?" <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I went in to get my hearing checked because my my ears were always ringing from the, a lot of the firefights and the you know tanks we were around and the, you know main can't gun main gun um, engagements. We, we we brought in a lot of. The, I'm getting sidetracked, but a lot of times we were around that we had tanks with us, so we we're sure. Uh, they're doing main gun on the uh, enemy positions. Mm-hmm. Um, went to get my hearing checked, and uh, they do a brain MRI just to rule out a brain tumor. A brain tumor will cause your ears to ring as well. Okay. They found a clot in my brain, a very small clot. So wow. that's not normal. Um, one thing led to another. I ended up at a cardiologist. They did an echo of my heart and asked me if I took any trauma to the chest in Iraq. Hmm. And I was I told them a story. Hmm. Turns out the uh, when I got hit, it very similar to traumatic brain injury. The uh, the concussion, the impact tore my mitral valve and my heart. Oh my goodness! So that's in, so in hindsight, yeah, I had all wow. the symptoms of the injury, but I never realized. And how long after the the fight is this medical exam? This is they found. So it's probably about six months five to six months they found the clot and then after that um probably about another month and they did that so probably about six six about six months wow and i've been you know doing regular physics you know i've been doing everything everyone else has been doing wow and the heart's the one muscle you don't want to like because i was over i was so my heart was leaking mm-hmm. uh it's also called mitral valve prolapse the heart pumps the valve the blood actually flows through the mitral valve which mm-hmm. has been damaged um Sixty percent of the blood was flowing out into my body. Forty percent was staying in the uh, heart chamber. Wow! Is a really, uh, um, basic way to, to explain that. Sure. So, so my heart was actually working harder to make up for the uh, the, the the blood that was leaking. The so, mm-hmm. and that's the one muscle in your body you don't want to enlarge because you know you have a this limited size chest cavity. There's no room for it to grow. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so at that point. Uh, they were like, hey, we can, um, you know, stop all activity and we're going to do surgery. Um, and we think we can repair the valve, but hey, just in case we can't repair it, we have to replace it. Hey, the, the, we have two options here. There's a pig valve, which would last 10 years and then I'd have to have surgery again. I was like, you know what? I was, I was, uh, 35 at the time. What was that? 36. Yeah. No, I was 30. Yeah. 36, sorry. <laughs> so I'm still young. <laughs> young now. But, um, yeah, and I was like, you know what, I'll go with, if this happened, but they were very confident they could repair the valve. Hmm. Um, I said, no, I'll go with the uh, carbon fiber valve because that'll last 400 years. And I could wow. will that to my grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so we had surgery, and uh, really great surgeon. He is, he is a former armor, um, army cardiac surgeon hmm. um great. and you know i was in louisiana which is a, if you're gonna have heart surgery is one of the best places to because they have a lot of problems with uh obesity and heart disease so it's actually a great place to have heart surgery <laughs> no they didn't they did not evacuate i was a station at fort polk in louisiana at the time i'm sorry if i forgot to mention that earlier and so once this was diagnosed they did not send me to walter reed they just kept me there and they were going to do it locally okay and which turned out to be good um yeah, so the kidding. surgeon instead of cutting my chest he he was Certifying this technique that you go through the rib cage is non evasive, mm-hmm. which turned out to be critical later because it's one of the reasons I was kept on active duty. Um, anyway, I uh, had the surgery, and when I woke up, um, you know, I, I remember waking up. I had, I was in the ICU, I couldn't talk, and it was rough. I, I immediately started choking. Mm. I remember my wife was holding my hand, and it was bad. I like immediately. I I like felt like I was suffocating, which I had some like some kind of blood in my lungs or something. But um, I couldn't talk to her. But somehow she knew what I wanted to know was hmm. what did they did the valve? Did they repair it, or did they replace it? Hmm. And she just <laughs> she said, "I'm sorry that they they, uh, they replaced it." Hmm. And then you know I was at a uh, at that moment. I just remember like turn to the side shut my eyes hmm. yeah, I mean that was just like wow um you know for to me because I had become I was I had been enlisted for 15 years for going off to cadet school and I became an officer because I wanted to be a, a you know a company command a commander mm-hmm. and I was still just a lieutenant and 
uh, you know, and it's be your whole your whole vision, your dream, just ripped away like that. That's what was happening right as I woke up. Huh. Um, wow. So. Wow. Uh, um. How's how how did you have to recover from that? Just inside your head. Um, I mean, I I don't know. I was there. Um, it, you know, I was probably in a very dark place for a couple of days while I was in the ICU. Mm -hmm. Um, once I got moved out of the ICU, um, I had more like friends and family coming in there. Mm -hmm. And my triathlon coach. <laughs> someone who I had spent a lot of time, you know, done a lot of triathlons with, and I, hmm. and I was a triathlete before the war, um, and I, one of my goals was to do, you know, be, do a half Ironman and an Ironman, hmm. and, uh, you know, I had the doctors telling me, hey, I'd get this great disability pension, and, you know, yeah, thank you for your service, but you're going you're gonna to be disabled, you, know, you won't stay in the military, there's no way they can keep you, because I was also on a, a blood thinner, not having a, a having this carbon fiber valve, a prosthetic valve, means I'd have to be on a blood thinner for the rest of my life. Because, of, um, basically because of, you know, the, the carbon fiber valve in the heart attracts red blood cells, which, you know, forms clots. And okay. That's the last place you want to have a, a, yeah. a clot. That's where the previous clot in my brain when, before, when, when I was injured, when mm -hmm. I took the hit, it had broke loose. Okay. That's where that clot had come from. Um, anyway, so I was in a pretty bad space, but then I started to have friends and family coming, and this triathlon coach, her name's uh, uh, Stacy McMicken, she was just yelling at me, he's like, Iron Man, Iron Man. Hmm. And here I'm like laid up in bed, <laughs> and I got a tube out of my butt. That was when I, uh, that's when I started to see the light. Okay. Um, and I, that was the first glimpse of hope I had. Huh. I mean, that's really what kind of shook me, and said, hey, you know, there, there's hope. Um... And that was, you know, I was a, a dark place, but it, I saw the light after that. Wow. Um, wow. So recovery, uh, months, uh, years. Uh, I mean, are you recovered reco today? <laughs> I get. I think I'm recovered. I don't. Well, so recovery started like I got out of the hospital. I spent about twelve days, twelve days in the hospital, and got home. By that time, I was walking on my own, and I. It seems after that point where she was yelling triathlon, triathlon, you know, Iron Man, Iron Man, is when I, you know, that's that was a tipping point where life mm -hmm. started getting better. But mm -hmm. uh, I got my strength back and stuff. Um, so I got home, and we were living in Alexandria, Louisiana. You know, it's fairly close to Fort Polk, and uh, this so this hospital is handling handling my rehab. Well, they weren't used to having young athletic people doing this type of uh, you know recovery. It was really de used to dealing with elderly cardiac patients. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, like, the first day of rehab, I'm asking questions like, when can I get on my bike? When can I start running? You know, I was starting to get, you know, I, now I had a better glimpse of the light. Hope was yeah. coming back, and I was like, I'm going to recover. Um, you know, and I was like, I'm going to fight. I'm going to recover, and, you know, I'm going to stay in the military. So, but they uh, they didn't know what to do with me, so ended up, <laughs> I started off, uh, they gave me some, I had a heart rate monitor just from, from doing a triathlon training, mm -hmm. they ended up uh, giving me some heart rate guidelines, and I started training within that. Um, I was on my bike, um, on my trainer, and then uh, slowly progressed from there. Five months after surgery, I was I participated in a uh, tri uh, sprint triathlon as a part of a relay team. No way! I did the bike, yeah, twenty twenty mile bike. Like a uh, uh, something for disabled vets, or are we talking? Oh, no, regular race, yeah. I, I don't mean to slant anything negative on any folks who've been through a hard physical injury, but I'm saying, are you competing against athletes without injuries? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No, wow. Normal, everyday, healthy people. So. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, disabled, like people, I, mean, I don't look disabled just because I just still got all my arms and limbs, but sure. obviously internally, I'm like the $300,000 man. <laughs> with the, but, um, You're kind of yeah, like so Iron I, Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This little thing going on in your chest, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a normal, and I and I did pretty good. Uh, our relay team, I don't know if we we, we placed. Uh, you know, we were definitely in the top fifty percent. Wow. So it's not like I was suffering. I and I made, and I did the ride. It wasn't a flat ride. It was you know a relatively hilly ride. Sure, so, that's great. Yeah, man. And so, congratulations. <laughs> so then, ten months after surgery, I did a full strip sprint triathlon on my own, and then 
11 months after I did an Olympic distance, which... Wow. And then um, went to my next leadership course. Um, I, obviously, I'm not, I'm not... I don't run as fast as I used to, but uh, <laughs> got there. They did a... Um, you know, passed my physical fitness test, mm -hmm. and they did a, you know, medical check on me, put me through this big evaluation, mm -hmm. and uh, I got cleared to stay on active duty. Um, I went to Korea for uh, 18 months, commanded a tank company near the border, North Korea. I came home, and one of my goals that I stayed before was do a half Ironman, and ended up uh, April of 09. I got home in October of 08. April of 09, I did the New Orleans half Ironman. No way, man. Yeah, I completed that, so that was... Uh, that's, that's incredible. Just, that's that incredible. Goal. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that's, I'd say it's incredible to anybody I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. But so, that's impressive. <laughs> wow. It's a lot of drive. So uh, this personal really... trainer, uh, you owe her a high five or yeah. <laughs> or a few harsh words. I'm not sure which one, but yeah. <laughs> sounds like she yelled at it at the right time. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And when I reflect back on it, that's one of the, turning, that's one of the things that sticks out in my mind. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so we talked um, a few weeks ago about just where you are right now with Hope, and you mentioned something about just, um, you know, you keep bumping into on a daily basis or a regular basis this thought of, man, I'm not, I'm not what I used to be. Um, yeah. I don't have the same speed, the same um, capacity, because it sounds like you were an incredible athlete before the injury, and you're still an incredible athlete compared to normal standards here in the U.S., and so... Um, how, how does that go in your head? What are you doing there? And how are you getting through the the daily hit of, uh, I'm just not what I was thinking I'd be at this stage in my life? Um, well, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Like, I feel like sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm racing or chasing my old identity. Hmm. Um, you know, I'm a fairly big person. I'm 6'5", weigh wow. about 235. Hmm. But I used wow. to be, I used to run pretty quick. Um, endurance was a lot better. And, you know, some days I do better than other days, but I'll, uh, you know, I'll think back and just say, hey, I used to be able to do this, no problem. Mm -hmm. Now I'm running slower or I'm not recovering as quick. It's just a constant battle with my old identity. Um, some days I do a lot better with it. Some days I, you know, I'll catch myself feeling sorry, about, sorry, sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the end, um, it's just accepting the new normal. This is the new normal. That, that that old person I used to be is not. I mean, I got to say goodbye to that, hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and it's really it's like breaking up with someone or something. <laughs> That's a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It really is. Um, so it's a struggle. Hmm. That makes but, sense. But um, just doing, you know, I love physical fitness, and this, you know, I, I get pretty fired up during workouts. So uh, I'm usually it wears, you know, I get over it pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> That's great. So how are you engaging in hope today? So I, I hear your story. The relationships you have obviously around you have been an extremely bright point of hope. And I like your definition of hope. And one that I keep falling back to personally is, is not, it's not optimism. It's, uh, it's not hoping for something that I um, think would be far-fetched or way out there in the future. Like I, I hope I'll have so much money by a certain date or I hope I'll get this next uh, promotion or whatever at work, but more of a, an assurance of things that are, that are reasonably going to happen. Um, and it sounds like you definitely had some people behind you who said, hey, I know your capacity, I know it's real for you, get off the bed and get on the bike. Uh -huh. and, and get out of your head and, and get into action and get out of this one thought, the funk, the whatever, and get with it. So today you're working with a lot of wounded warriors, obviously. So. It, that or any other example, how are you using hope today to impact the folks around you? Um, one thing I did um, when I was in grad school at Pepperdine, we had uh, one of our assignments was we had to start a blog to influence a particular population. Hmm. Um, I've always been uh, passionate about you know helping wounded warriors, wounded veterans, so I uh, start a blog, yeah. um, and I tick when I run. Like if I were to be there, and run around the room, you would hear my valve. <laughs> <laughs> the carbon fiber. So I do tick when I run. Okay. So I was just thinking, like, what's a cool name for a blog? And I was like, well, I tick when I run. And uh, you know, I was pretty positive that domain name was not taken. So I did the search. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I and I got that. And I started this blog. So it started off as a grad school project, but then I just kept it up after I got out of school. 
Um, yeah. So I just write about my like um, things I do, endurance races. But how I use that, so I log that and I use that um, in my work with Team Red, White, and Blue. Um, one of my duties is the one of my roles is the outreach director, veterans outreach director. I touch base with every uh, wounded or disabled veteran mm-hmm. that joins, mm-hmm. or any member that's wounded or disabled, because we have community members join as well. And I and I always shoot them a link to my blogs. Like, hey, uh, you know, here, here's a here's a story. Uh, here's my story. Um, I can relate to what you're going through. And, um, you know, usually, as I said, people don't look at me and think I'm, you know, I'm a wounded warrior, disabled, they don't mm-hmm. understand, you know, the internal injury I suffered. Um, but uh, once I share that with them, I think it, it helps people see, all right, you know, this isn't some guy that doesn't understand what I'm going through. It's some, you know, he yeah. went through, he overcame adversity himself. Yeah. Um, so that's how I share that. And then uh, this um and every day waking up and, uh, you know, engaging in, in positive activity, mm-hmm. working out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a little bit older now, things are, like, this weekend I just did a Fenway Spartan. Spartan race in Fenway Park. And, uh, That's awesome. you know, I love doing stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I wake up every day and just, you know, glad to be alive. <laughs> All right, so, so before you go on, let me, uh, let me echo that. <laughs> and uh, make one good point about the Spartan race because it's a fantastic event. So... What you're saying from an action standpoint is you are you're directly engaging with your own heart uh, to get up, be positive, and get out there. And I understand some folks may say, well, that's optimism. Y- yeah, but sometimes that's where it starts, and it doesn't matter. The point is, you got something tough going on. Get back on your feet. Think about it. Take a deep breath. Um, sometimes that deep breath takes months through a lot of counseling. Sometimes it takes surgery. Sometimes it takes a second, and you can get back at it. So you're doing that get yourself ready and then you're going after it from a, uh, a team standpoint with folks who have related to same situations that you've related to and I think that's a really key point there's a lot of things that happen to us that we say what in the world and why and I don't know the answers to all those questions but it is amazing how much we get to become part of a community that's dealing with the same things and there's always somebody else out there who's dealing with what you've dealt with I think that's really neat, and that's helped me a lot, too. I mean, that's cool. The Spartan Race. So you jumped online, went to Spartan, Googled it, Spartan.com. I don't know their website, but that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And then, um, you know, I've I've done them before. This was was my third one. Incredible. And and this going back to your point on optimism, I I think I draw confidence and strength from a people around me, but two, the things I've accomplished. Mm Mm-hmm. So if I get up one day and I'm able to, you know, I go run five miles or whatever it is, hmm. um, that gives me confidence and that gives me enough confidence knowing, hey, you know, in, my, in the new normal, I can do this. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not fighting against my old identity. I'm not wishing I was at that, the old John Silk. Now, here's a new John Silk. I can do this. And I'm accepting, accepting of it yeah. and I'm satisfied with that. I hope that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> But um, it's just I draw strength from my own accomplishments and those around me, and that gives me confidence to go to the next step. So hmm. it's just not blind, like, you know, optimism. It's real progression. Like, hmm. if I rode 5,000 meters today, I know I can go out and row 5,000 tomorrow and making those. And, yeah. and you're really making a difference. You're, you're, I'm making a difference in my own life. I'm taking control of my life. And this new normal, I own the new normal. That's a great it's point, not, too. So. Taking control of it. That's a great point. It's you or somebody else or something else. You may as well be the one. Exactly, yeah. Driving the ship there, yeah. And it's being accountable for, you know, at the end of the day, I did volunteer to go in the military, and the war started, and, you know, I definitely wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I went back to, I didn't have, you know, I chose to stay in the military as well. Um, And, you know, I went to Korea. I also went, I deployed to Afghanistan later as well, Um, which was a huge healing thing for me, just be able to go back to combat. Mm Mm-hmm. No, that that was another uh, that was that was key in my in my mental health, I think, because to me, okay, I had made you know I I had recovered back to warrior status again. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it might sound a little crazy, but uh, to me, and mentally, I was like, yeah, you know, here I'm going on deploying back to combat. You know, I've 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 recovered enough. So did you uh, you huge. put two chest plates in the armor that time? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, they had upgraded the armor by that. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was I served as an advisor, so I really wasn't in a direct combat role. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. So but I was just to me that was a huge mental, 
yeah mental uh thing you're back back in the yes. game yep Man. exactly yeah back in the game yep great job all so, right last question how can how can people that are listening take what you're saying and do something with it so you may be talking to somebody who's dealing with depression suicidal thoughts they may have just had a divorce they may have uh, lost a child to something hard it may be a, a teenager who's wondering what to do with a, a tough relationship that's bringing them in the wrong spot what what do we need to do to take that control you're saying get out there be active doing something to change what's going on today um well first it takes i think um owning understand owning the problem owning hmm. being accountable for what is for yourself and for your actions mm -hmm. at that point um and, and it's admitting you're vulnerable there's a vulnerability there mm -hmm. once you once you acknowledge a vulnerability mm -hmm. i'm vulnerable then you can say hey you can start talking to yourself say hey gather the confidence to overcome that vulnerability overcoming adversity and that, that's where courage comes from then you have the courage to take the first step to conquer depression conquer your physical disability mm -hmm. um get over that relationship uh, that bad relationship that loss that whatever the loss is, whatever that void in life is, yeah. acknowledge the vulnerability, that gives you the courage, then you overcome that. And then reach out and interact with others, find others, share stories, talk to other people, mm -hmm. draw strength from those around you, mm -hmm. and keep yeah. going, and don't stop. <laughs> Man, that's great. I hope that made... That, that, it makes a ton of sense. Going. It does. I'm going to put those in the show notes on the website as well. I okay. think that's a, a great little bullet point. I can detail those out. Man, that's really fantastic. It really is. Thanks so much for sharing today. We uh, we get to talk to some really neat people, and I'm impressed. I really am. Um, well, I appreciate that. I, we've all had hard times in our life, but um, you've had some pretty rough days at work. Right. <laughs> I'd say a few rougher, harder, <laughs> harder days than I've had at work, that's for sure. <laughs> well, they, uh, I love doing what I do at the end of the day. So it Yeah, I can fun. tell. I can tell. And that shows up. Okay, so if folks are trying to get in touch with you, how can they connect to you? How can people find out where you are, what you're doing, and how to follow you along in your process? Uh, best way, you go to my blog, itickwhenirun.com. Okay. Spell that out. Um, if you say I, if you Google I tick when I run, it'll pop up. Um, two, I'm on Twitter. Okay. Um, J Silk Team RWB. That's J, my ad. J Silk Team RWB, like red, yep. white, blue. Got it. Yep. Uh, that's my, I'm on Twitter there. And uh, Facebook, I'm on Facebook, Jonathan Silk. Feel okay. free to connect with me. Um, Great. And then once you connect, contact me through one of those uh, platforms, I'll be happy to continue the conversation. Man, that's incredible. All right, so there you go. I tick when I run dot com, and Jonathan Silk on Facebook, yep. and Twitter is J Silk R W T. No, Team RWB. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Silk. S-I-L-K, Team RWB. I should be writing this down. Yep. Fantastic. All right, last question for you, which is not one of the five, but it's a fun one. I love listening to music. I know a lot of folks do, and it kind of gets them through a, a hard time. We all have those songs that get us back on track and out of our funk. What are you listening to when you need to get going? Um, I love listening to... Uh We'll start off with some like '80s stuff, like Van Halen. Yeah. Maybe some Motley Crue. <laughs> I love it. But but then we'll get into some uh, type. So there's research out there. There's a great article in the Wall Street Journal that music that's over 120 beats a minute adds, you know, it gives you it improves your performance during workouts. Yeah. So I really get into like some of the high energy like techno music. Okay. So anything like that. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. So if you had to pick one song from Van Halen, what would it be? Uh, jump. Jump from Van Halen. Yep. How about from Motley Crue, if you had to pick one? Uh, Kickstart My Heart. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Kickstart My Heart from Motley Crue. I'll see what we can do. We'll see if we can play the episode out with that. Man, right. It's great <laughs> talking to you. Thank you again for your time today, and thanks for your service for all of us here in the USA. And I know there's a lot of folks listening to this abroad as well. And regardless of uh, political situations and, and who we've – uh, cheer for when tough times are going on worldwide. It is always a privilege to talk to somebody who's um, taken their beliefs and what they stand for and really made a difference and an impact and um, and fought to uh, to be somebody. So thanks. Really Thank appreciate you. it, John. It's good to talk to you. Yep. All right, man. Enjoy All your right. time. Bye-bye. You've just listened to I Share Hope. 
If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.